Ambassador Lipstadt, thank you very much for joining us today at the Neighbors Annual Meeting. We call it the Leadership Forum, uh, and we're really uh, grateful that uh, you can spend some time with us. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure being with you, and uh, we go way back to graduate school, so it's sort of uh, like old times sake. Indeed, indeed. Uh, before we get into specifics, I'd like to draw on really on your decades of experience in researching and monitoring, writing about, um, teaching about anti-Semitism to ask you the following. What is it that separates contemporary anti-Semitism from what preceded it? Well, everything and nothing, you know. Uh, let me step back and say, I often compare uh, anti-Semitism to a virus. Uh, even a, a you know a herpes virus, which is a terrible thing for people to have, and there are certain kinds of herpes viruses which uh, you never really get cured from. I think now there may be some things that cure people from them, but it's something you carry with you, and it uh, morphs and it adapts, as we've seen with the with the COVID virus, um, and it can come out at times of stress. You know, everything is fine, and then you get an attack because you're under stress or something. I think anti-Semitism is very similar to that. Um, it, it emerges at times of, not only, but certainly at times of stress in the society, because Jews uh, proved to be a very convenient uh, scapegoat, a very convenient, uh, who's, who's the problem? Who's behind this? Why is this? Uh, it's the Jews. Um, and that's in part, of course, because of the, tropes which are with, with which you are well familiar and certainly your, your leadership is well familiar uh, that undergird or underpin anti-Semitism. Uh, namely, Jews are all rich, not true. Jews are all powerful, not true. Uh, but they control things and they control things in a malicious, evil way from behind the scenes. Uh, it's a conspiracy theory. So when there are times of stress in society and you need someone to blame, out comes the conspiracy theory. So that's not dissimilar to uh, Germany in the 14th century, France in the 18th century, and America in the 21st century. But now, so that's where it's the same. Where it's different is it takes on the attributes, the characteristics of the society in which it is emerging. Well, let's talk about Europe. You've referenced Europe, and we associate anti-Semitism with Europe, and rightfully so. Now, anti-Semitism in Europe over the last decade, decade and a half, uh, as it has every place else, has increased on the far right, the far left, and among uh, radical uh, extremist groups, Islamist groups. How have anti-Semitic manifestations differed across the continent, and what trends have emerged? For example, uh, the rise of, of right-wing, extreme right-wing parties, populist parties, uh, ultra-nationalist parties. Uh, what's, what's happening if you look across the, the, uh, the length and breadth right. of, of the right. European continent? Right. As, as you noted, and so much of your work, of course, is international. My work is international. State Department, we're supposed to stay out of domestic matters. Uh, but it's impossible. You have to be living under a rock not to notice the rise of domestic anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism in the United States. But looking at Europe specifically, um, it's it's not going to be that different there than it's going to be in the in North America, South America, uh, and and the and certainly Western and Central Europe. We're tied by the internet. We're tied by social media. Uh, things things go across the transom much faster than they ever did before. I think much of what we're seeing in uh, in Europe is not dissimilar to some of the things we're seeing in the United States. Now, uh, you you referenced this earlier, um, the fact that anti-Semitism is, as I like to say, ubiquitous. It comes from all places on the uh, political spectrum. So it's similarly in Europe, we see it coming from all places on this political spectrum. We see it coming from certain, and I'm not painting with a broad brush here and anybody who, who interprets it as that is wrong. Uh, we see it from certain groups on the left, which engage in anti-Semitic tropes, often tied to uh, crit critiques of Israel. Not, I'm not saying critiques of Israel are ipso facto anti-Semitic, that's not true. 
Um, but but often some of those critiques become laced with anti-Semitism. And we see it on the right in separatist groups and supremacist groups, militia groups, uh, nationalist groups, which used to be fringe elements, uh, but work their way into the mainstream. Now, some of those groups abandon their overt anti-Semitism uh, as they become more mainstream, but they are attractive to many people who are who have anti-Semitic anti-Semitic views or anti-Semitism as part of their uh, Weltanschauung, their worldview. So uh, while the leadership of a nationalist party, whether it's in Germany, whether it's in France, whether it's in Austria, wherever it may be, uh, is not necessarily an anti-Semite or, or not an anti-Semite at all, the people that they attract often have those views. 38 countries have uh, adopted or endorsed uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, worked uh, for, for years together with our colleagues and representatives of, of various countries on this definition. What, what has the growing embrace of the definition meant to our efforts to combat anti-Semitism around the world? I, I was present in Berlin in, in 2004, for example, uh, at uh, the OSCE's conference on anti-Semitism. Then Secretary of State Colin Powell gave a very important speech and, and some of that speech relating to um, criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism crossing the line made its way in years later, made its way into the working definition. Now we have that definition. Um, what can we do with it and, and how do we make it work? Um, I think that the definition has been widely accepted. It's been widely accepted not only by governments, but by um, NGOs, by corporations, by football clubs. Uh, in England, Lord Mann, who is the who is my counterpart in the United Kingdom, has been very successful in getting it accepted by uh, various and sundry um, football clubs. I was in Argentina, and two of the leading adversaries uh, accepted the definition. Um, I think the definition is very important. Look, it's not a be all and it's an, an end all. It doesn't mean that if every country accepts the definition and every a government accepts the definition, oh, that's the end of anti-Semitism. No one is suggesting that, neither you nor any of your a cohort who worked so hard on getting this accepted. I watched from the sidelines, but you guys did, a, you guys and gals did an awful lot. Um, but it gives governments, it gives corporations a framework within which to understand what anti-Semitism is. I mean, it seems weird and it's not, it, it, it's gonna seem weird to you, but not weird to you at all because you deal with this all the time, that there's so many people who don't really understand what anti-Semitism is. Um, and because Jews don't present in general as the typical victims of prejudice. We seem well-educated, we seem well-situated, we seem to have access to power, to leadership of organization, of governments and uh, countries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we know, A, those things can change on a dime, and B, that anti-Semitism plays on those exact things. So um, the, the IRA definition gives people a framework. Is it a be all and an end all? No, it's not but it is a framework. It's a framework for understanding it. And I think one of the things that's so important and it's critics and it has its critics as you well know, uh, like to ignore or tend to ignore or to be oblivious to um, is that it's a working definition. It's not a legal definition. It's a working definition. It's a guideline. If you look at the examples associated with IRA, those examples are introduced with the statement, these examples can, may, but uh, I forget the exact wording, but do, you know, may or may not constitute anti-Semitism. Uh, so I think it is a very important tool. And I've spoken extensively to my counterparts in Europe, among them Katharina von Schnurbein, uh, who represents the EU on this matter, a consummate, consummate diplomat, uh, strategist, uh, and just a person totally committed to this issue. Um, well, how use and she's often pointed out to me how useful it's been to various in various governments in guiding them in what this is. 
And you mentioned uh, Katharina von Schnurbein, uh, and I, just to follow up, um, because you also referenced meeting with your colleagues. You know, there was a time uh, when there was just uh, the position that you hold, it wasn't ambassadorial rank, but special envoy. Um, the United States was the only country that had such an individual following and tracking these, these uh, questions. Today, we see a growing number of countries that are naming uh, specific individuals with specific tasks, job descriptions to deal with anti-Semitism. How do you feel about that? I mean, is that, it, clearly it's a good sign. Um, and how important can this be to our collective fight against anti-Semitism? I would call it, when you say in Hebrew, Israelis have a saying, it's a chatzin nechama, half a consolation. It's great that it's happening. It means that there's a point person in the government to talk to, to work on these um, to work on these things, uh, to address them, that you don't have to start flailing around and going to a dozen different offices and a dozen different ministers and saying who's responsible for it. There's someone to track it. And there's someone to, for the Jewish community also to talk to if they feel uh, besieged, threatened, frightened, concerned, et cetera. The, half, the reason it's a half a consolation is that it's so necessary, but I think it's extremely important. And in fact, the first thing I did when I came into office, my first uh, sort of convening act was to convene a meeting of not all, but some of these representatives at, uh, with uh, Linda Greenfield, uh, Th Thomas Greenfield, uh, our ambassador, American ambassador at the UN, a very impressive woman, a very, very impressive uh, diplomat. Um, and she and I together convened a meeting of these uh, representatives so that we should talk and get to know each other. And then just uh, last month, or now it's December, so uh, two, uh, in October, uh, uh, Katharina von Schnurbein at the EU convened a meeting at the EU. And we're hoping every six months to meet to see what's working, what's not working, what's what's uh, what's the problem, how can we work together on certain things? It's, it's, it's very important. Two months ago, uh, we observed the uh, second anniversary of the signing of the Abraham Accords, uh, creating a, a, a system of normalization, establishing diplomatic relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, shortly after Morocco. We hope that this process will expand to include other countries, not only in the region, but also, for example, um, uh, Islamic majority countries outside, uh, such as Azerbaijan, which has just opened an embassy in, in Israel and, and perhaps Indonesia later on. Question is, the accords seem to present uh, an opportunity in the Arab world for growth in education and awareness, not just about anti-Semitism, but about Jewish history and Jewish culture as well. What do you foresee, having traveled now extensively, um, in the Arab world as the possibilities for educating against anti-Semitism in the Middle East? Uh, I, I see tremendous possibilities. Look, um, rarely has someone occupied this office and had a chance to do something positive, to build something. But as a result of the Abraham Accords, and this was begun by my predecessor, Ilan Carr, um, we've begun to reach out to uh, uh, signatories of the Abraham Accords, establish relations. Of course, the United States had relations, but how can we work on this issue together? And I think it's extremely important. The, my first stop, the first country I went to when I began my overseas travels was Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is, as uh, the optimists among us like to say, not yet <laughs> a signatory to the Abraham Accords, but it is changing its behavior towards tolerance of whatever word you want to use uh, of anti-Semitism. Um, it's, it's, of course, Saudi Arabia is changing in many regards. There are many problems there. There are many human rights problems. No one is ignoring those, just as we can't ignore the human rights problems in our own country. Um, however, having said that, and you remember this, you remember this from, from decades, uh, really, um, Saudi Arabia was one of the main sources of, of or purveyors of anti-Semitism in the Muslim world. It would send imams to uh, the United Kingdom, to Germany, to North America, to South America. It would fund them. Um, and it wouldn't fund them and say, go preach anti-Semitism. But that's what, they, that's what they would do amongst other things. And, and that's changing. 
uh, have all those imams stopped doing it? I doubt it. But the newer ones who are being appointed apparently are not. And there's been mon the you know different uh, NGOs and government organizations monitor the Friday sermons because that's that's extremely important for gauging a, a un uh, country's policies. And the level of anti-Semitism in many of those in the Friday sermons is way down, way, way down. The textbooks, Saudi Arabia has made extensive changes in its textbooks uh, regarding uh, the depiction of Jews. All those are positive signs. Is it enough? Is it far enough? No, we'd like to see much more, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's something in progress. And again, I'm not, uh, gilding the lily, as we might say, or ignoring the fact that there are other human rights problems which are extremely disturbing. But the approach of my office and the approach of my team is that if we can get, let's say, Saudi Arabia to move on this issue of human rights, on this issue of othering um, a group, and to stop othering a group, which is a shorthand for sort of what you do with prejudice, you make them other separate and apart. Um, then maybe it can spread to other uh, groups within the kingdom. Let's move to uh, the Western Hemisphere uh, for, uh, for the next question. The rise of left-wing governments in Latin America, and, and they, they come and they go, and they're back in, in some places, has um, exacerbated in some places anti-Zionism uh, in the region. Um, how do you think this is impacting Jewish communities, because here, if we can bring back the IRA definition, here we have the case of um, it's it's not exactly BDS, uh, but it's it's a lot of other things that ultimately, for example, at the United Nations, wind up in these biased uh, resolutions in the Human Rights Council, General Assembly, and other places. What do you see in in Latin America so far? Well, I was in both Argentina and Chile. Uh, Argentina has one kind of government. Chile has elected. Uh, a very left-wing uh, government. Um, the Chilean Jewish community is a small Jewish community. Uh, I think they estimate themselves to be a little less than 20,000, uh, but they. But I've also been told by members of the community and scholars that there probably are uh, 60, 70,000 Chileans who have some sort of Jewish connection, Jewish roots, mixed marriage or whatever it might be. Um, Chile also is the home to the largest Palestinian community outside uh, the Middle East. Um, ironic, most of them came, ironically, um, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century when the Ottomans kicked out many um, Christians. And they were euphemistically known in Chile as the Turks because they were kicked out by the Ottomans. Um, and for many decades, the Jewish community had very good relations with uh, this community. Uh, that's changed in recent years. Uh, we, didn't, we don't need to go belabor that point because it's, it's evident. Um, so in some, just that's by way of setting the scene, let's say for Chile. So what often happens in some of these countries, look, I was in, in South Africa, and that's another country which has that, which, in which we often see this. Their, their left-wing um, approach to politics, to international politics, um, often comes with a, um, a hostility towards Israel and a pro-Palestinian. Now, why, by the way, you don't have to be hostile to Israel to be pro-Palestinian to feel that you know, things have to be improved there, um, but that's the way it often plays out. So there is a, in the eyes of many of the people there, there is a feeling that these two things are connected. Um, and when I was in Saudi Arabia, actually I had an elderly imam say to me, if Israel solved the Palestinian process, uh, problem, uh, there'd be no anti-Semitism. So the historian in me said, hmm, I think there was anti-Semitism before there was a Palestinian problem. I think there was anti-Semitism before there was a state of Israel. I think there was anti-Semitism before there was Zionism. Herzl was you know, prompted to write Alt Neuland, his, his manifesto or his, his, his treatise on, uh, and, on Zionism because of anti-Semitism. And we go back, you know, French Revolution, I don't, all the way back. So uh, I'm thinking, mm, I could give him a history lesson. I said, but I don't think that's going to work. So instead, I said to him the following. 
I said, in my country, in the United States of America, there was a surge in hatred of Muslims after 9-11. Not fear of, but hatred, contempt. In fact, a, a person, a, Sikh, a man who was a Sikh, wearing because the Sikhs wear uh, turbans, was murdered because some idiot American thought, well, he's wearing the turban, he must be a Muslim, I'm gonna go kill him. So, you know, it's just, it's a horrific thing. Um, I said, so there was this uh, surge in, in hatred of Muslims, uh, which became so extreme that uh, in New York City, which I like to describe as the polygot capital of the United States, um, the city council refused permission, and I'm sure you remember this, uh, to build a Muslim community center, Islamic community center, which would include a mosque adjacent to 9-11, adjacent to the ground of 9-11. I think the land, the land may have already been bought before 9-11, but it was going to be adjacent. And uh, they said it would be a desecration to the memory of the victims. And there were many people and many Jewish organizations who thought this was wrong. Why penalize a Muslim in, in, the, in lower Manhattan who may want a, a mosque to pray in or a place to take their children for Islamic activities or families or things like that uh, because other Muslims attacked and murdered people in that building? So I said that to him. I said it was wrong. It was prejudice. He said, you're absolutely correct. You can't penalize every Muslim because of what was done there and that uh, political action. So I said, well, this is, I'm saying the same thing about anti-Semitism and Israel. I said, there is a serious geopolitical crisis in the Middle East, something that has to be resolved. It's, it's, it's a powder keg, and when it explodes, it will explode with a vengeance. Um, but that doesn't uh, validate or justify spreading anti-Semitism. Um, the two are separate and apart. And he listened, got very quiet, but I wouldn't um, say he completely agreed with me, but he didn't push back. So that's the way I present it. A couple more questions uh, before we conclude. Um, talking about strategies to combat anti-Semitism, what strategies have worked uh, and what are the opportunities for a, a broad, a coordinated approach. I know you're you're working with the the envoys, uh, but beyond that, uh, Annette, for example, Austria uh, has a a national strategy on fighting rising anti-Semitism that includes improving the protection of synagogues, improved education about Judaism, uh, stricter prosecution of hate crimes against Jews. Um, you think that that this approach, this the strategy approach, and others. Uh, can be replicated elsewhere in the European Union absolutely. or beyond? Absolutely, absolutely. I think the national strategies is, are extremely important. A, it forces agencies across a government, education, um, justice, uh, law enforcement, foreign policies, to think about this issue in a comprehensive way. Um, and then it forces them as they create a strategy to put their put their put their words where their mouth, you know, their money where their mouth is, so to speak, to, to put the tachlis, to put brass tax uh, uh, on the table. Uh, so I think it's extremely important. It also means that a, a government is coordinating this, is looking at this in a holistic fashion and not sort of just, you know, everybody uh, doing their own dance. Um, and uh, we, I'm now in government six months, and I talk to my colleagues that, uh, look, I, my, my uh, remit is overseas. If you work in this building, you deal with things overseas. You don't get involved in domestic politics, et cetera. But you'd have to be adult not to recognize the confluence between international and domestic anti-Semitism. So I talk to my colleagues in uh, the Justice Department, Homeland Security, et cetera, just to find out what's going on. Not to say, oh, I'm gonna get involved in something, justice does domestic things. Uh, Homeland Security is domestic, of course. Um, but just so that we should be talking to each other. And as my uh, deputy likes to say, uh, it's not if something happens, but when something happens, we will, we will be able to be in touch with each other, especially if there is a overlap between domestic and international. Well, he says something which I had, 
I intended to conclude with, with the question I'm about to ask, but something just occurred to me. Um, the term mainstreaming is now coming into play. Normalizing, normalizing. Normalizing or mainstreaming anti-Semitism because you mentioned uh, domestic, uh, the issues here in the United States, but one could apply that elsewhere. Is, is this a, a, a growing phenomenon, which is to say, oh, you know, um, celebrities say this and, and the, some of the media say that and you kind of get, you get accustomed to it. Um, press releases are issued, um, tweets are, are, are posted and then we move on to the next. Is, is mainstreaming um, the, the, um, the, uh, the way this is going to be or, or not? I mean, are we, are, we're fighting mainstreaming, right. uh, but what do, what do you see in terms of this kind of normalization of, of this ex church? Exactly what I see. It's exactly what I see, whether it's celebrities in this country and other countries, um, uh, you know, jokes, uh, various and sundry things that it becomes things that couldn't be said uh, 30 years ago or now or 20 years ago are now okay to say. Jokes that couldn't be told not so long ago are okay to say now. Chants at football games that couldn't be chanted not so long ago are okay now. Uh, I see a mainstreaming and it is uh, very troublesome to me. Very, very troublesome. And it's troublesome because it's very hard to fight. It's not that you need a national uh, a national policy, you know. If if it, if something is in the mainstream, is very hard to turn it around. That's why it's so important that people with a voice, whether they're government officials, whether they're celebrities, uh, whether they're sports players, wh whatever they may be, in whatever country they are, speak out against this. You know, it's it's not just that maybe the because we're, we're wrapping up, just I want to get this in, um, not just because anti-Semitism is bad for Jews, which of course it is. Fighting anti-Semitism would be a worthy thing to do uh, simply because it affects Jews. A group in your society is under threat. You fight, you protect them, you fight it, you fight that spread of that hate, you fight that hatred. But, but there, there are other reasons which make this e even more important. Uh, anti-Semitism is a threat to democracy. If you adhere to an anti-Semitic worldview, well, Weltanschauung, as we scholars like to say, worldview, um, you believe that conspiracies rule your government. You believe that there's a Jewish conspiracy to rule the media, to rule the banks, to rule the election system, to, to whatever it might be. And if you believe in that, then you don't believe that your government is a fair or viable government. Um, anti-Semitism is a threat to relations between communities. We certainly see it in this country. We see it in other countries, how some people like to play on that and pit Jews against other groups, other minority groups. Anti-Semitism is the canary in the coal mine. It's the canary in the coal mine with something that, uh, a, a, a phrase I know you're well familiar with, Dan, it may start with the Jews, it never ends with the Jews. But it's also a canary in the coal mine that it may start here, but it is going to undermine your society in a very serious fashion. You know, I used to make speeches decades ago, and I would say, you know, there'll come a time when there won't be a survivor to point to the tattoo on their arm to say, I experienced this. I was, I was in the camps. I, I, I was a victim of this barbarity. We are reaching that point um, where the number of survivors, just the biological clock is, is simply, that's what it is, and, and it's running out. Holocaust denial and distortion is present across social media, quite pervasive on some platforms. What do you think the best approaches are for confronting Holocaust denial, uh, which, which really is growing apace as we move further, we're now 77 years beyond 1945. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's ironic. Uh, first of all, uh, Holocaust and all is a form of anti-Semitism. That's, that's all, it's, it's absurd history. It's absurd uh, 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 bastardization of history and it's, it's a form of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, I, you have to expose the truth. You have to expose the illogic in it. You have to show how it's an anti-Semitic uh, trope. And you have to show that the de a denier has no evidence 
no witnesses, no narrative, no nothing. So how does such an absurd idea that this was all made up um, or exaggerated get legs? It gets legs because there's the anti-Semitic soil in which, to the, which those legs get planted. So I think one of the things, of course, there's much more I can say on it, and maybe that's for another conversation. Uh, but one of the things to recognize it is that this, this is an anti-Semitic trope par excellence. Well, uh, the work that you've done uh, on this particular subject is uh, something for which we are all grateful. Uh, I think you brought this issue to the fore. Um, it's, it's with us and still growing, but the work that you did is so important in in drawing the the description in in the the, uh, the reference uh, to this to this problem uh, from which we many of us have worked uh, ever since you've done that that work, uh, Ambassador Lipstadt, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join us today. I want to wish you the very best uh, in the, the coming year. Uh, your tasks are immense. Um, we a lot of us, uh, many of us, depending on you and your voice, um, and we wish you well going forward. Thank you, Dan, and uh, depend on me and work with me. Um, and I know you have my back and you're by my side and I am exceptionally grateful. Um, and let's hope we can make a dent in this thing. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks a lot.